So welcome to everybody to the DLF for Professionals Reflections on Person-Centred Advice about assistance, Assistive Technology and its role in maximising independence. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Melanie Poyser, who's the Partnership Manager for London and South East England with DLF. And she's going to be talking, giving you an introduction to DLF and giving you the latest data insights from providing the Ask Sara service within the UK. So Melanie, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Right. Lovely. So thank you everybody for coming this morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Melanie Poyser and I'm the Partnership Manager for London and the South East. So what that means is that I will work closely with any organisation that is in within my region to discuss any kind of um, service improvements that you would like to make for your um, service users by integrating some of the tools that I'm going to talk about today. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just a little bit brief um, information about myself. I worked for 15 years prior to coming to um, DLF. I worked for a local authority for 15 years managing services for vulnerable, disabled and elderly people. Um, that centred quite a lot around major and minor home adaptations and also included working with the three major hospitals in London, um, Guys, Thomas's and King's on their delay, um, reducing delays from hospital and also fall prevention. So coming to DLF, it's really great to be able to marry both perspectives together and look at the solutions actually in action and how they can benefit um, organisations like where I used to work. So there's my details just there. And today I'm going to be talking about, giving you a bit of a whistle stop tour about um, DLF and our history. I'll be discussing ArcSAR in a little bit more detail and talking about some of the research that we've done into um, user um, usage of ArcSara. So we were founded in 1969 um, and one of the key things that we've always found is that we've responded to all the legislation that's come in over the past 50 years. We have been abreast of things in terms of the socioeconomic changes in society and specifically around um, the disabled community and how their role has um, not so much changed over the past 50 years, there's been some advanced advancements, but there's been a lot that has stayed the same. And our mandate is really to push that agenda forward to ensure that people with disabilities have um, a really great quality of life. And one of the things that we do really well is to ensure that responding to those changes is looking at new innovations of how we can deliver services to the public in terms of our information that we provide um, to the public and to professionals as well. And we really do understand the needs of disabled people and specifically the assistive technology marketplace, which constantly has been evolving over the past 50 years um, and specifically where we are now around digital um, assistive technology and how it can be implemented for people with disabilities. And we're really proud to say that we're still adding life to years by the work that we continually do. So the DLF was the brainchild of Lady Hamilton, that's her on the right, and she campaigned tirelessly for people with disabilities to ensure that they would have access to equipment that would ensure they have a better quality of life. And this coincided very closely with the first piece of disabled legislation, which was the Chronically Sick and Disabled Person Act in 1970, which aligned perfectly with what we were trying to achieve as an organisation. One of the key areas and one of the key um, features of DLF in the very early days was our equipment, our uh, independent living centres, which hosted a range of equipment that professionals could come along and try. And our mandate then is the same as it is now. We want to act as a shop front for disability aids <clears throat> to help disabled people lead a fuller life and to serve as a resource centre for professional workers. And as I said, we've maintained that over the past 50 years. And at that time, we had two OTs who managed the centre and there was over 300 different types of equipment that people could come in. And they were very simple things, but they revolutionised how people could live in their own homes. Fast forward 50 years and we have another piece of legislation that is changing how services are delivered for local authorities and has extended the expectation 
for people with disabilities and their carers. They want to be empowered. They want to have a better um, well-being and health. And they also want to look at independent living and how they can be in their own homes for as long as they want to. So we have developed um, a range of different services for um, the public and for professionals. And although we no longer have our living centres, we do have a brand new shop front and that is really hosted online. And that is our Living Made Easy website. So we have a range of tools and we want to we always want to be relevant to what's happening, as I, as I mentioned earlier. So we have a range of tools that we have developed. And obviously, as I mentioned, Living Made Easy, which is our website, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, we have DLF Pro Assist, which is our latest um, tool, and that's specifically for clinicians in prescribing. So very early on, we had the Hamilton Index which hosted all the equipment that an OT or anybody prescribing equipment for a service user would use to find out information about equipment. But ProAssist is our latest and it's an evolution of the Hamilton Index, if you like. Um, and it hosts a number of features that will assist the OT or the prescriber to be able to find the best equipment for that service user. We've got Your Able, which is our online forum that we that the general public use to talk about a range of issues around equipment and generally anything. And as a carer or as a disabled person, often there's a lot of issues that you need to find out what's going on. And that's one of the key ways that we try to reach people. We have DLF for professionals and under that we host our training programme, mainly made up of the Trusted Assessor programme, which many of you may have been on. Uh, we have levels one to five, not that you have to take them in that order, but we have a range of trusted assessor um, training available, as well as other kind of um, training for professionals. We have our helpline that's available for the general public to call in if they need specific help, if they want to speak to somebody about equipment or other funding issues, for example. And we have our SARA, which I'm going to speak to a little bit more about today. So we've developed the Living Made Easy programme for the public, which is more than just a new website. It is simplifies really what DLF is about, making life easier for everyone. And it's whether you've got a disability you, or you are a carer. So ArcSara, um, as part of the Living Made Easy programme, we're excited about the continual development that we've made with ArcSara. Um, and it's designed to help the public to explore a whole world of possibilities in terms of solutions that can enhance their lifestyles and they can make informed decisions about what they want their care to look like. So in three easy steps you are able to receive a report that provides you with solutions and signposting to assistance in terms of services or um, advice specific to the need that you need help with. ArcSara um, was developed by occupational therapists, but all the questions that are asked on there are very much what an OT would be asking um, a service user for an assessment. So we have over 90 topics and they range from daily living activities, for example. Um, we have things from dressing, um, bathing, toileting, preparing meals and household chores, which I just want you to focus on that one because I'm going to do a little, I'll be talking you through how it's used using that specific tile. Um, we have health and well-being, again, ranging from things to do with sensory, um, right through to mobility and memory and mood. And we also have a section for children. So focusing on household chores, if we was, what we do is we drill down a little bit more into detail. So what specifically around household chores do you need to know? So we would go to washing and ironing clothes, that tile just there. And then you would be asked a series of questions. And, that, and all the questions that are asked are specific to that specific task that you have concerns around. You'd either ask yes or no to the questions. Once you've finished your um, questions, you would then get a disclaimer, which would basically be telling the user that although we're providing you with this report, you may feel that your needs may be such that you would want some more help. And this is where you as an organisation could signpost your service users to receive the help that they need. Then you would view your report and your report would basically show you the answers to the questions. So, for example, we put, do you have difficulty seeing the washing machine controls? 
and we answered yes. So it would give you some advice about that, but it also has what you can buy to help. So underneath there, my picture seems to have disappeared, but there would be a picture of a specific area. So you could buy something around labeling. So if we were to click there, it would take us through to a range of products that you're able to purchase around labeling. So it's given a range of ones. This is just the top line, but you could scroll through and there's different things that people can look at. So if we were to click on the first one, A5 Talking Message Cloud, it would take us through again to some more information about the product and also where you can buy it. And when you click that um, yellow writing that says where to buy, it would take you directly to the supplier's website where you, as the service user, could purchase that um, particular piece of equipment. And what's really great about Artsara that we have over 10,000 pieces of equipment on there that extend from digital technology such as this right through to some very simple firm favourites that are continually used by our service users. So in essence, Arcsara is the golden thread that links um, the user with the disability or their carer to assistive technology, the retail world, health, social care, um, voluntary sector and housing. And what we try to do is that lower, um, that horizontal row is to get them communicating around the best solutions for the service user. So why ask Sarah? Um, basically, we know that local authorities and organisations have massive challenges ahead. We know, for example, there's an ageing population who are living longer with complex health conditions. We know that there's a demand on services, hence a demand on budgets. And the biggest thing of all is being COVID. It has changed how we do everything, how we live, how we exist, how services are delivered. And I don't think life will be the same moving out of the restrictions. And it has almost forced us in a way to change how we do things. And some of those things are for the better. So what we have found is that people are willing to buy if they know where and what to buy. So knowledge is key for people. We also know that an OT intervention is not always required, especially for some of the lower level um, needs. And people are not always one dimensional. So it's not one size fits all and everybody's going to be very different. And service users often know best what's right for them. So really taking a steer from them that they know what they need. What we did, we conducted our own research um, and we looked at ArcSara usage over a six year period and we collated data from over 200,000 reports covering all 90 topics. And what we found was some really interesting trends. So we found that bathing, we found the top five on each um, snapshots, if you like, of time. So in between 2015 and 16, we found that bathing, eating, drinking, bedroom, heli kit and toileting were the top five. And over into the past year, we have found that mobility, walking, memory in the home, bathing and low energy are the top five in that regard. And we can look at why these changes have happened. And part of it is, I believe, that as um, local authorities and even as ourselves offering trusted assessor training, we know that we're meeting needs because bathing and showering is often looked at and people's needs have been met in that regard. But also what we're seeing is that people do have additional needs. So things like mobility and walking, and maybe due to the lockdown, people are wanting to think, well, I want to get out a bit more just for my daily exercise. But one of the key things that we're seeing as well is that um, as things like dementia, as we see things with cognitive impairment becoming more of an issue being in the home, that people are looking at solutions there as well. And another key thing was looking at low energy, which is quite telling that people are affected by what's going on, um, specifically probably around um, lockdown, having a disability during lockdown and probably being a carer during this time as well. Again, what we found was that walking aids and things to do with falls have quadrupled. We found that um, assessments around mobility has tripled. Memory in the home, as mentioned before, has become even more um, important and has doubled, and as, as has uh, low energy. And we found that there was a reduction in, as I said, bathing, showering, and those very general kind of things that I do believe that we've become quite good at assessing for. 
And we found that there is a, cost, or a consistent level in terms of people's interest and what they want to know about kitchen, medication management, stairs, telecare, toileting, wheelchairs and scooters. In terms of the kind of profile of our users, it was really interesting to see that over, the over half, well over half, are looking on behalf of someone else. So we know that people are interested in what's going on in other people's lives to ensure that they have the best outcomes. So whether they're a relative or a carer, they've been looking on Arxara to find solutions. We know that over 60% have intended to purchase now or in the near future. And again, if people know what they need to purchase, we know that they're happy to do so. And that's the key word. They need to know what, they, how their needs can be met and what they should be purchasing. And again, because they're happy to purchase, we saw that 71% would fund this privately themselves. And as you can see, some of the, some of the um, equipment is quite, it can be quite inexpensive. We're not talking about huge amounts of money, but the actual spend can actually change someone's existence. If they know, for example, with that item, they can wash their clothes, it makes a difference between them maintaining their own personal hygiene and being able to go out and function as a productive member of society rather than having to feel isolated because they cannot use their washing machine. Again, drilling down, we found in terms of the top three um, users of Arxara was parents, spouses and children. And again, it could be looked at in terms of the lockdown time, why parents have been looking on Arxara um, to find assistance for um, their disabled children, for example. We know that children often look for an older parent um, and obviously partners are looking to assist a, a, a disabled partner in that regard as well. So it's really telling that the universality of Arxara is quite broad in terms of who our target groups actually are. So why have a customised version? Every locality is different and you know best the characteristics of your specific um, locality. It's unique and your as are your residents needs. And this can be reflected in your own version of Arxara. We also look at the fact that it makes caring easier. So if you're a carer, knowing that you're living 24 seven with somebody potentially, you know what their needs are and to have that at your fingertips that some need has changed, you know, needs change over time. So being able to know that at your fingertips, you can go and find something quickly without having to rely on the local authority to um, assist you with that care need. Obviously, there's options there that you can go to them, but this is actually providing different pathways. And speaking about pathways, it's about a holistic assessment. It's about you as a local authority or an organisation capturing the right information um, specific, so specifically to create pathways to where you want your residents to really go. So being able to direct them to equipment is brilliant. If you want to direct them to specific services or partners, you can do that as well as part of that assessment so that you're giving your users actual um, options of how they can best meet their need. So one of the questions that I sometimes get asked by local authorities is they want to know what happened next. Did the person actually go on to purchase something? Did they, were their needs met? Now, if you are concerned, you can have a bait in form or you can link or a link that redirects back to you. So if you do want to do any follow up work, you can. Another aspect of Arxara is that on a monthly basis, you do receive a report um, and that will allow you to know how your users are using your version of Arxara by topic or by other information specific to the needs of your um, organisation. It's about working in partnership. So, for example, if you do work with a community equipment store, you might want to promote specific product categories. Um, it could be that you want to highlight which things are available as part of your product category. And one of the areas that we found is that if, for example, you have a handy person service and you know that somebody is identified as needed a grab rail or something like that, it can link directly to the handy, pers handy person service where that person could call and potentially get that fitted for them. And it can detail the costs and everything like that of having that service done. And it kind of reroutes the service user from going maybe specifically to an OT service and takes them somewhere else 
whether it could be Age UK who runs the um, handy person service or whether it's in-house. And also I always have been an advocate when I worked in local authority, that it's everybody's responsibility. It's not just about an OT going out and having to do an assessment. It's about if you work in housing or if you work in any other team really within the council and you visit a service user who's vulnerable and you pick up on a need, it's also your responsibility to ensure that that service user need is met and ArcStar is a brilliant way of ensuring as as a interim as an interim measure that that person can actually get their foot in the door to have an assessment if you're a supplier you might want to and you've got a range of products in your portfolio and you have service users coming or you have customers coming to your website you might want to actually um, signpost them specifically in terms of where you want them to go as well so it really branches out not, not just to a local authority but if you are a provider obviously it's a technology and you do want to also help your customers find the right equipment for them so in the pipeline we have a range of different things that we're working on to improve arcsara um, we're looking at new advice and topics we're looking at different pathways as well. So looking at vision, hearing, dementia, we're looking at learning disability as well. Also, we're also considering social prescribing because it's not always going to be a piece of equipment that's going to help somebody, but it might be something happening in your locality that you want to add onto your version of Arcsara. We're looking at how we can make it better um, for usability whether we put on the interactive videos of how to's, so how you would use a specific piece of equipment, maybe employing a chat function, just in case somebody has further information, um, questions about how to use a specific type of equipment. And also we're constantly adding new products and suppliers because without that, we don't have the, the breadth of knowledge that we currently have, have harnessed over 50 years. So it's really fantastic that we're able to communicate with especially some of the smaller suppliers who may be feeling that they don't have a platform, um, we're able to engage with them so that they can have some reach to other communities and other markets as well. So that's a very quick whistle-stop tour of um, the DLF and ArcSara. As I said, my name is Melanie Poiser and if you do have any questions, specifically if you're in London or the South East, please do drop me a line um, or ask a question at the end and we'll be able to help you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Melanie. For anybody that uh, didn't join right at the start, if you did want to ask any questions, then feel free to put them into the chat box and I will put them to Melanie during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dawn Pridham, who's a service manager at Newport County Council. And she's going to be talking about Newport and the Penguin project and policy, legislation and service delivery. So I'm just going to share your slides for you now, Dawn. There you go. Good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully technological difficulties I've been having this morning will spoil this. But if for any reason I do disappear or the sound uh, um, drops off, the, the visuals drop off, then James will try and pick up and read the slides or we can just send the slides to people afterwards. Um, so uh, like Jim said, I'm Dawn Pridham, I'm the service manager for uh, the first contact service within Newport City Council. Um, so that service is, is exactly what it says it is. It's the first contact um, that anybody should have with the County Council. It's um, firmly in the information, advice and assistance arena uh, within the Social Care and Wellbeing Act context. Um, and this is how we came to use Ask Sarah. Um, so James, next slide, that's all right. Thank you. Um, so just to cover a bit about how we started this journey, really, um, just to, to pick up that it did start off as an occupational therapy led project. Um, we knew that the residents were contacting us for information that was out in the public domain. Um, as OTs, we felt we had a good local knowledge of what was out there. Uh, but obviously, as a Newport resident, um, you, you, if you lived in one area and possibly not the other, you might not know what what um, resources were out there. So we were really looking to draw everything in, into one place. Um, we knew we wanted um, some kind of tool for residents to seek out for the information, what they needed and when they needed it. And again, that statement sounds so simple, but with the amount that information changes and resources open, resources closes, that really wasn't an easy task. Um, we were also, we also kind of 
toyed with the idea of seeing if we could do something for ourselves. And we did speak to a couple of local companies, started to go down the route of designing something for ourselves, um, you know, a fit for, for local people. Um, but that that kind of bit the dust quite quickly as we realised how complex it was and the amount of um, manpower it take, would take to run and to update and to resource it and to make sure that it was continually and consistently correct. Um, we then started to talk um, to ask Sarah about bringing it into uh, Wales from England because I previously worked um, in English County Council and our head of service had also worked as a head of service in England as well. So we, we, we'd used it in an English context, but we knew that with the change in legislation um, and like the Welsh language requirements, we knew that bringing it to Wales, it, it would have to look different. Um, we also wanted a site that the residents could trust as a safe and evidence-based resource. And that was really important picking up um, on some of the that the previous points about the fact that it is evidence-based, it is overseen by OTs, it is peer-reviewed and it, it is trusted. So we knew that it came with a good reputation. Uh, and then the perfect storm happened, the Social Care and Wellbeing Act actually came in, which um, put information front and foremost in um, kind of service design and it no longer became an option of possibly giving out some leaflets every now and again, it actually became a duty. So we, uh, you know, it, it, it all came together it round about 2014 in, in a really good timely manner. Next slide, James. That's good. Thank you. So our journey started around about 2017. Um, and it took a lot of work. That's not an understatement to put it politely. There were many, many meetings. Um, we spent a lot of time filling in and localising and testing the workbooks because that was absolutely key to um, making it specific for Newport and making it quite specific for Wales because we were the first authority to bring it into Wales. And that did take a lot of work. Um, once we'd actually filled in the, the workbooks and tested that everything had been translated onto a a live system. We then had to do extensive work about making it act compliant and fit for for what for the for the Welsh residents. Um, the Welsh language work that we did cannot be underestimated. I mean, Welsh is a very ancient, complex language. You cannot just put it into Google Translate and keep your fingers crossed. You really can't. So that was a huge amount of work. When you look at lessons learned, I think that was one of the, the biggest ones about actually translating it this huge complex system into into another language. Um, luckily we did have Welsh speaking OTs, we did have a Welsh speaking social workers and we had Welsh speakers in our, our very frontline customer service facing as well. So we were managed to test it extensively in English and in Welsh as we felt strongly that we couldn't launch one one kind of um, site without the other. They both had to go at the same time to, to, to meet the legislative requirements. Um, we then took it to residents um, and staff in varying roles who trialled it and, get good, uh, and obtained feedback. Um, we tested it with physios, we tested it with carers, we tested it with customer services people, we tested it with OTs, we tested it with social workers, anybody that would actually um, come within about 10 metres of us, we asked them to trial it. So we did absolutely extensive tests before we rolled it out to the people of Newport. Um, we also gave a bit of feedback regarding the actual site content um, and the way that the actual Ask Sara system was actually set up because when you get your personalised reports at the end of it, we wanted the um, information advice much higher up to, to reflect the act rather than the kind of alerts you need in assessment. But that wasn't fully possible because it was a huge system. Um, uh, revamp basically which we would have to wait for the next cycle uh, for the system to be updated so so that was really useful to kind of work with the team to give um kind of very constructive clinician feedback and how we would have liked to have seen the report so hopefully that's that's going to be a continued work with as we do it and then we finally launched the site um in july 2018. next slide please james 
Um, how it's worked, it, it absolutely 100% in Wales works with the information aspect of the Social Care and Wellbeing Act. It is something um, that we can now measure, which information to date hasn't been that tangible. We haven't really known um, how much was going out, what the effect was, how it was helping the people of Newport. It was very much kind of what we what we thought or what we felt. So this absolutely nails down for us the information aspect of it. Um, again, picking up about it being a common thread between the, the, the wellbeing model and the Newport locality prevention um, and wellbeing model, it absolutely fits in with that lower level preventative, accessible, um, person-centered, person-focused ideals that the person is in control of their well-being and they can they can take the advice and the information and run with it. Um, in Wales we have something called the Dowers website which is a um, locality uh, it's 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 uh, it's all through Wales but if you want to know about certain things in certain areas you type your postcode in so if you want to know which pharmacies were local or which hospitals were local or where your nearest carers groups were that's the kind of thing that Dowers does so it really complemented that so potentially you'd get your personalised report you can have a look at the content and you could go on to Dowers and find out where all your local options were um, it, it, it did go quite well um, and then it did go penguin so now um, all of white residents have the same access so you don't have that kind of postcode lottery of one person um, who lives kind of five miles away from another person gets you know one service and it doesn't and Gwent's quite a small authority in the sense that we've, we've got a very dense population and there's five kind of local authorities really close to each other so it, you know, it made perfect sense for the model to go regional to have the same access in the same area. Um, it's heavily promoted. We use it within the service area, the OT, the city contact centre. So if you phone the council, all the contact centre staff are trained to say, you know, have you used Ask Sara? Do you know about Ask Sara? Do you have access to the internet? Um, if you come into our one stop um, information station, it's called where you're asking or inquiring and the people there are trained to take someone to um, a device that's in the information station and actually go through the process with them so again if they turn up you've got somebody who's actually there who can um, take you through the, the system and to give, get the report and print it heavily promoted throughout the New City Council website and the circulars to the staff intranet, um, the, the community connectors bulletins and the carers bulletins in. So we've really done a lot of work with promotion. Um, we run kind of 50, or we used to pre-COVID, 50 plus events where a couple of thousand people would turn up and that was always kind of front and centre of that as well. Um, and it has actually, you know, quite seamlessly become part of business as usual. It's fitted in really well. Um, and again, picking up um, what was said previously, about it's given us a real, really good understanding of what the residents are actually looking for. Sorry, that's my dog. There's always got to be an animal somewhere, somewhere on a live presentation. Um, it, it, it's you think like so this started off as a occupational therapy. Um, pilot and we thought you know the traditional bathing traditional stairs but that's actually not what residents are looking at so that's been really really useful for us to inform um what uh, what our service design is, is looking like so we get the stats monthly and it does vary i'm you know, picking up from the previous points it absolutely does vary of what um what is being looked at um, and so that that feedback from the site has been really really useful so next slide and Please hope the dog stays quiet. <laughs> um, and this is just a really nice example of where we think um, Ask Sarah fits in. It absolutely fits in the, the wider part of it. We're supporting people and families to stay well and connected. It crosses over into well, as well into the people working who need the extra care and support because they want to stay as independent as possible. Um, and it absolutely helps support people and the families to carry on living well at home um, and also into the professionals as well. So apart from maybe the very core part of this where people are unfortunately tipping into managed managed care, possibly hospital, it actually pans this um, this this agenda really, really well. And I like pictures, so that's a very visual one for people who like visual stuff. <laughs> 
Thanks, next one. Um, yes, this is some direct feedback that we've had from some of the residents that have used it. You know, what was the outcome? So again, picking up uh, from the previous presentation that they were going to get in touch with social services for help. Um, people were going to go and buy equipment. Somebody used one of the links to arrange a care agency. Um, something as simple as I'm going to keep a list of emergency numbers by phone. You know, so they haven't actually, but the beauty of this, they haven't actually got to go and buy something. You actually, actually you don't actually have to, you know, do anything that costs anything financially. It could just be really simple, practical advice that you could do. Um, again, just taking on the next bit of feedback was looking at some of the practical aids and some of the advice, um, contact society. Uh, again, something as simple as cover for mobility scooter, but that could be the difference between somebody going out and doing their shopping and being independent or staying in because it's wet or they don't feel safe using the scooter. Um, and I think, I think site use as a date is that we've had, you know, 1,218. So if even a portion of those got some some knowledge, some um, life improvement out of it, then, then all the hard work has been, it's been absolutely worth it. Um, the next slide, James, please. Uh, yeah, again, through COVID, um, the figures have remained steady throughout the pandemic, picking up one of the previous presentations, the topics have varied depending on which stage of the pandemic we've been through. Um, there's actually more accurate figures now coming um, on the monthly basis that actually understand uh, the actual issues of the site. So um, we're getting more accurate figures on the actual amount of people that are coming through, whereas before um, it was not specifically um, to do with the Newport region. Now we're getting much more accurate figures. So that's actually trebled in the last month, which is really good to hear. Um, and the one thing it did throughout the whole eight, you know, 18 months, or however long it's been there, it actually gave us confidence that it was still there and it was still running. It was resilient. You know, the rest of the world was changing and all our services were reeling and the staff were under immense pressures but in the background this has been absolutely resilient it's run it's been consistent it's never failed so you know it's it, it really has been that's one thing where uh, undoubtedly all your services have changed Ev everything has changed that bit was absolutely constant which is reassuring because you don't have to worry about it uh, and then the next steps obviously we're going to continue to use the system um, we could, we're going to try and relaunch it because everything, you know, needs a bit of a refresh every now and again and see if we can find some areas that we haven't promoted it in. And then obviously continue to work with the Civil Living Foundations to see how else we can use it and reflect on success in other areas because obviously each local authority might be using it a bit differently. So we're, we're still open to, to learning and changing um, what, what we do next. I think that's it. Fantastic. Question about the, like the operational or the practical parts of it, then you know, either pop it in the chat, like James said, or I'll take questions at the end. Lovely. Thank you very much, Dawn. Much appreciated. So, it, just like Dawn said, if you do have any questions, pop them in the chat box for us, and we will uh, we will put them to the panel at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I am going to move on to Louise Lapworth. Now, unfortunately, Louise cannot be with us today. So we've actually got um, a recording that she's sent in. So I'm going to play the recording for you. Bear with me. So um, we launched um, Ask Sarah in Warwickshire to the public in September 2019. Um, we did do a, a bit of a soft launch internally with um, staff and also with our members um, a couple of months before that. Um, we obviously felt it was very important um, to get our councillors in Warwickshire on board with it as well, because obviously having the links out to their own lo local communities, um, that they could promote it um, within, we felt it was incredibly important to um, tell them all about it before we went ahead with the public launch itself. So we ran our campaign from, um, September to January and at the bottom of the slide you will see the branding that um, we used for that campaign um, and I have to say we went through um, several iterations of design both within our internal design team and also working with our internal um, project team um, and internal and external stakeholders before we um, got to this final um, brand that we decided to go with 
Um, something we were very clear about was from the start was what we did not want it to look like. We did not want it to look like just another um, county council campaign. We wanted it to be lively and striking and something that would certainly get people to sit up and pay attention. Um, but something we were very um, clear about was the, the strap line of make life easier because we felt this was absolutely essential to what Ask Sarah was all about. Um, it was about giving people access to smart ways to stay well. The website was incredibly simple and easy to use. And this was all about um, uh, letting people know about the gadgets and solutions that were out there to help them to stay safe, healthy and independent at home. I can move to the next slide, please, Ben. So this very busy slide here gives you an overview of all the campaign activity that we undertook in Warwickshire. Um, and I must point out, of course, that our campaign was pre the pandemic. Um, and certainly there are things that we did then which we wouldn't be able to do in current conditions. But of course, moving forward, um, hopefully, who knows, the end of this year, going into next year, we'll, we'll be able to pick up and do some sort of face to face marketing activities with people again. So in the centre of the screen, you'll see um, some of the marketing collateral that we developed in terms of posters. Um, we made sure these were amply distributed around our own council office buildings, um, particularly in those offices where we had um, adult social care um, staff situated. Um, again, in sort of areas of high public football, footfall and areas where um, we knew that our councillors would see them also. Um, I talked a little bit about um, the, the partner launch event that we did, which you'll see at the bottom of the screen. And there's a photograph of all the members of our health and wellbeing board in uh, Warwickshire um, at the sort of launch event that we did with them. Again, where they were given an overview of what um, Ask Sarah was all about. Um, social media was incredibly important to us in terms of getting the message out um, both or organic posts and some uh, paid for um, social media content as well um, across our Facebook and Twitter channels and I'll talk about that in a little more detail in a moment. Um, we undertook a radio advertising campaign with um, Free Radio which is one of our biggest um, commercial radio stations in Coventry and Warwickshire. We did a, a number of community pop up events at um, two of our major hospitals in Warwickshire and also we utilised our network of libraries to go out and speak to people in their communities about Ask Sarah as well. Um, we, we, we got some really good media coverage off the back of the events that we did. Um, we did some direct uh, mail outs to people within our communities that had already um, subscribed to receive uh, news from us. Um, and that was very effective as well. And um, later on in the campaign, um, uh, based on the, the fact that we, you know, we'd had really good response to that date, we invested in doing um, a pharmacy bag campaign as well, um, working with a company called Table Talk Media. Um, and that got the message uh, directly out into 37 um, pharmacies across Warwickshire as well. So, um, and I must say that all of the um, branding work was done um, in house and we didn't use any external agencies to develop the campaign. So I must give credit to my, my amazing colleagues, uh, Mike Jackson and, and Rhiannon Sims, who, who worked so hard on developing the campaign. If we can move to the next slide, please, Ben. So um, this is the, the radio campaign that we did with Free Radio. Um, we ran it for two weeks when we did the initial launch in September and based on the success of that, we did another two week campaign in December as well. Um, and as I say, the, this is sort of a major local commercial station. Um, their average um, listener age is 39. So this was very much about um, targeting carers as well as um, those sort of potential users of um, the, the products that Ask Sarah would be recommending. Um, so we developed um, a couple of radio advert scripts with Free Radio um, using the, the voices of um, 
the, the potential end users, speaking about their, you know, their own experiences. Um, and we try to match those with the um, campaign material that we developed, the poster material um, and so on as well. So we had uh, one advert in the voice of a, 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 an older gentleman and one in the voice of a, a younger female as well. So if we can move to the next slide, Ben. Um, as I say, we did a, a number of pop-up community information events. Um, one at Warwick Hospital, one at George Elliott Hospital, which is in Nuneaton. So we covered the, the south and the north of the county. Um, we did one at um, Shire Hall, which is um, obviously our, our main council office based in the centre of Warwick and across our library network. Um, and the, these worked really well for us. Um, basically myself and one of our occupational therapists that obviously had in-depth knowledge about the sort of um, products and, and gadgets that Ask Sarah would give access uh, to and tell people about um, that they came out on the road. Um, we, you'll see in the, the top left hand corner there, the gentleman, that's um, actually our portfolio holder for um, adult social care and health, Councillor Les Caborn. Um, and he came out as well, which was really great to have his um, support um, down at Warwick Hospital. And as well as being able to speak to patients, this gave us a really great opportunity to speak to staff um, within the hospitals in particular as well and make them uh, aware of it. Um, um, and the, the library event also proved to be um, really successful and we got a number of library staff on board to, to help us out with that. And again, you know, the great thing about being able to do events is that you can use those as opportunities uh, to promote um, with local news releases, again on social media, um, to get digital mail outs to those communities to tell people that you um, are going to be out in those locations and it just gives you another angle to um, promote the site. So we can move to the next slide, Ben. Um, at this time, we used um, a digital mail out service called Gov Delivery. We have since moved to using MailChimp, but at that time we used Gov Delivery. And um, as I said earlier, this enabled us to target our messages to individuals working in health and social care that had already described, uh, subscribed to receive um, these sort of mail outs directly in their email inboxes and also to target um, individual communities across our boroughs and districts in Warwickshire. Can go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, the Pharmacy Bag campaign was a four week campaign that we launched in December. We, we thought the timing of um, this was particularly key. Um, I think, you know, unfortunately, as we've seen in recent months, um, this is a time of the year where um, illness picks up. You find a lot more people going into pharmacies and it's, um, sometimes carers that are going in to pick up prescriptions on behalf of people as well. So um, we felt this would be a, a really good way to get the message um, in front of people. Um, 37,000 pharmacy bags were printed up with our Ask Sara campaign branding. Um, so that was a thousand for each of the pharmacies. Um, it also gave us an opportunity to get the message out to pharmacists and the um, Pharmacy bags were backed up with um, a poster campaign as well. So um, poster materials were sent out to those pharmacies, along with a covering letter explaining what the campaign was all about. Um, and again, this was supported by additional in-house communications. Um, and of course, using paper bags, we felt was a lot more um, environmentally friendly than um, other sort of options, um, you know, branded pens, that sort of thing, um, we decided this was um, a much better option for us. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, again, this is about the social media reach that we achieved, which was a mix of um, paid for and organic. Um, and we were very um, pleased with um, the, the reach that we managed to get and the amount of engagement that we got through Facebook. We can go to the next slide. Um, uh, and again, that's an example of one of the um, posts that we sent out. Go to the next slide, please. 
Um, we also used Twitter. Um, I think the great thing about Twitter was the amount of sharing that we saw, particularly um, by partners that we were working with. So um, South Berkshire um, NHS Trust. Um, it was the same with um, George Elliott um, Trust in Nuneaton, um, the CCGs and our borough and district council colleagues were all great in sharing those posts for us. Um, we also tried to do um, uh, something a bit interesting with the sort of posts that we did put out there. So on the right hand side there, you'll see um, a little video that we put out of one of the um, animatronic cats that we took out to events with us that got a lot of attention. Um, and uh, so we, we managed to get a good few um, views of the, the videos that we put out of the, of the cat. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and that's uh, just some more examples for you of the sort of sharing that we saw um, on Twitter by um, partners. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is um, a, a marketing funnel diagram, which sort of shows you in terms of the reach, um, particularly on social media that we got with the campaign, how that actually translated into engagement and how that then went on to translate into um, the amount of people visiting the website, which of course was absolutely key to us. So we can go to the next slide. So that's an overview of the sort of campaign that we activity that we did. And you can see that um, most of that was around September and October. Um, we did do some newspaper advertising as well, which we felt was really important to get the message out to people that were perhaps um, not online, um, which is, you know, absolutely key to get out to those groups as well, um, as well as doing all the sort of digital work that we did as well. Um, the pop-up community events that took place across October, November, and then, as I say, going into December, January, we did the um, pharmacy bags campaign. So if we can move to the next slide. So the great thing about working with DLF is um, the quality of the data that you get back in terms of who's visiting your website. Um, and that been, has been absolutely key to us in terms of campaign planning. Um, so as this shows, as you would have expected, um, most of the website entrances were at the start of the campaign, um, which obviously proved to us the value of us running the campaign and the different methods that we were using to market it and to get it out there. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Um, we were obviously used, able to use the Google Analytics data provided by DLF to show us where people were coming to the site from. Um, it was really interesting to see that most people were coming directly to the site, which meant that they were perhaps going into their browsers, directly entering um, the website address. Um, so that proved to us the power of um, sort of the, the marketing collateral we're putting out in terms of posters and that kind of thing, um, the pharmacy bags, which actually had the website address on them. Um, Gov delivery also um, proved to be um, great for us in terms of getting uh, people to the site. Again, you can see Facebook proved really, really effective, much more effective than, than Twitter. So that was really interesting. Um, you know, a, a lot of people were, were actually Googling it. So obviously they, they'd seen the publicity and were actually Googling Ask, Ask Sarah Warkshire, which was great. Um, and the SharePoint statistics show that um, our own staff were responding to the internal communication that we'd uh, done about it as well. And we're visiting the website off the back of that. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, and again, you can sort of go down into all sorts of detail um, using the, the analytics that DLF provide. Um, and this sort of shows you again over the course of the campaign how we moved from initially people coming directly to the website and through things like Facebook to later on in the campaign, it was more um, sort of staff responding to the internal communications that we'd done about it. So we can go to the next slide. So um, th this was sort of pre the current version of the Ask Tara website that's being used, which of course is um, sort of um, more mobile friendly now. So we found that the majority of people were um, uh, using the, a desktop device, you know, a laptop or desktop computer to access the website rather than um, mobile or tablet. Um, but we think that would very much be um, different now if we were to look at the analytics again running a similar campaign. So if we can move to the next slide. 
So um, that shows the number of uh, total site entrances that we had over the course of the campaign. Um, the, the brilliant statistic for us was that 74.5% of these visitors were new visitors. Um, so they weren't the same old people that had come to the site once and they were coming back uh, again and again. That um, also proved to us that it wasn't just our own staff that were visiting the website and using it as a tool that actually this were, was sort of members of the public um, using the site. And the other um, brilliant statistic for us was um, in terms of the number of reports that were completed by people coming to the website. Um, because, you know, again, that was absolutely key. We didn't want people just to come. Um, have a quick look and then go away. We wanted people then to engage with the website and then to go on and to complete that um, self-assessment report, um, you know, either for themselves or for someone that they cared for. So if we can go on to the next slide. So our, our conversion rate in terms of site entrances to completed reports was um, 0.46, so which basically tells you that for every site entrance, just under half of the visitors that visited the Warwickshire website completed a report, which we were really, really delighted with. So if we can move on to the next slide. So um, other speakers will have talked about um, the, the sort of the revamp of the website. This is how our Warwickshire website is looking now. Um, it's got a refreshed look. Um, it is easier to navigate. Um, it is more mobile friendly. Um, and um, yeah, we, we are on the verge of doing our own public relaunch of that. In fact, we put out our first um, sort of communications about that yesterday. And if we can move on to the final slide, you'll see hot off the press, we have updated some of our marketing materials to reflect what the website is looking like now. And um, this is what we will be pushing out um, over the next few weeks and months. So I hope that gives you an overview of the sort of activity that we undertook in Warwickshire. Um, working with DLF, as I say, we were really delighted with um, how the campaign went. Um, and, you know, thank you to DLF for all their support um, with that. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, thank you to Louise. I know she apologises that she couldn't be here in person today. Um, I'm going to hand over now. Again, if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat. We are running about 10, 15 minutes behind, so apologies for that. Uh, but we will, we will keep going. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to hand over now to Kate Bowman, who is from Newcastle City Council. So she's going to look at Newcastle City Council's digital suite of prevention and information tools. So Kate, I will hand over to you. Lovely. Hi everyone, hopefully you can see that. There's always that moment, isn't there, where you think, is it going to work? Is the technology on my side today? So thank you very much, James. My name is Kate Bowman. I work in the information and prevention team in adult social care at Newcastle City Council. And we've got um, a series of tools that we're using uh, to communicate with people. And we've chosen to go down a very digital route. Now, it's not the answer for everybody, but it is a major part of what we're trying to do in Newcastle. So the idea is to head people off from phoning uh, adult social care for information if it is well organized and easy to find on our digital tools. So what you see here is sort of the suite of our tools. So we've got the Newcastle City Council corporate website, which covers a lot more than adult social care, as anyone who works for a council would know. But sitting on those pages is our equipment chatbot. Now that's an automated chatbot, and it's been developed with a series of cards, uh, and it's sort of predictive. So we've worked out what people think, what we think people will be asking and set it up to answer those questions. And the reason I brought it into the conversation is because it is an equipment chatbot and its primary function is to link people to our version of the Asara website, 
which we call Your Equipment Newcastle. And this is the logo you can see here. Our first tool, however, was the Information Now website, which is 15 years old later this year. This has been developed and become a trusted brand. And so what we want is to develop Your Equipment Newcastle as a trusted brand in Newcastle as well. Hence, we've gone for a very tailored form of this, the website. So Information Now has 14 categories of information, ranging from leisure and lifestyle, through to money, through to benefits, through to work and retirement, etc. It's a trusted brand, has uh, hundreds of thousands of hits, and that's what we're trying to achieve with Your Equipment Newcastle. We're in, in comparison, Your Equipment Newcastle is in its infancy. Another major part of the strategy for the city is to develop our digi digital accessibility. So broadband is being put in throughout the city. In the heart of the city, we have free Wi-Fi. And that's a very important part of what we're trying to achieve as well. So nothing is happening on its own. It's happening as a strategy for the city. So here you can see how we have tailored uh, Asara for Newcastle. So we've got a new logo. This is actually our second logo. We decided that this was a more inclusive approach indicating clearly that we're supporting people with a disability, as well as those who are perhaps just struggling to do things that they used to do. And you can see we've taken this particular image here to show that we do understand that quite often somebody else is helping someone to find information. So just as uh, Melanie said at the beginning, we know that quite often an older person might not be the person using our websites. A major part of our strategy is the prevention information and advice work network for the city. So that prevention and information network comprises both health and social care teams. In particular, we include uh, our mental health hospital. And then we also have the whole of the community and charity sector involved. So there's about 200 participants. Now in 2019, when we were meeting face to face and talking about how to provide information, how to signpost better, what a good referral looked like and things like that. In 2020, during the pandemic, we moved to a webinar uh, situation and we ran a series of webinars called Navigating the Maze. And they were focused very much on older people and dementia. And those were really successful and brought people to our provision of information and advice that hadn't been involved before. So that was really good news for us. What we did was we recorded those webinars and we put them on our YouTube channel. So just like uh, today's webinar, which James will be loading somewhere on the DLF site, you know, we did exactly the same people. So you keep bringing people back using your social media to remind people what's already out there and available. This network we used in particular to promote both Information Now and Your Equipment Newcastle. And we found uh, an upsurge in usage once the community sector, uh, maybe the social prescribers and people like that in the city, as well as uh, volunteers in the city. We had a massive array of volunteers during the pandemic, supporting people to get information or to get help. So here I'd just like to show you a little bit about the usage of your equipment, Newcastle. So I said earlier that we used the chatbot to bring people to your equipment, Newcastle. But just as uh, Louise outlined earlier, we can see the new visitors on the site by month, uh, sorry, by quarter, and we can see the returning visitors. We can also see the number of visits and we can see the number of reports. And we're working with David to see if we can get a little bit more on how many of these people go on to choose a product, because that's just really inf interesting information and will help us to decide what to do in the future. 
here are the topics. Now, again, Melanie was quite right to say these things can surprise you. So we assume that people will be looking for how to get into and out of a shower, how to take a bath safely. We assume that because a lot of that information is held amongst our OTs in the adult social care occupational therapy team. But there were other things that started to become apparent about getting into and out of the bed, helping emergencies, getting around the garden. And actually stair lifts and through floor lifts has risen in the last year. But we also know that people are looking for those simple things around reaching and making sure they don't uh, fall over when they're reaching to do something. We've been able to triangulate what we've got on your equipment, Newcastle, with what we can see on our chatbot. So as I said, this is predictive technology. So what we've done is work through a series of scenarios of conversations and set the chatbot to answer those questions and take people to the right tools. So it might be to an organization like Disability North, or it might be through to uh, the information on your equipment, Newcastle, or it could be to information now, but we also signpost to Social Care Direct, your equipment, Newcastle, um, the GP, etc. So those chatbot themes very much mirror what we have been seeing on your equipment, Newcastle, and on information now. So triangulation tells us what is going on for our council and our population. So essentially we've gone down a digital route and what we understand by that is that it's dynamic and we can offer timely information. But I'd also like to add that it's very resource intensive. So you have to manage this resource and you need people to do that. So you can't develop a chatbot or your equipment Newcastle or information now without people sitting behind it, looking at the evaluation and the feedback and developing it to do more and more. So for instance, with information now, in 2017, we developed a new section on equipment, sorry, on events and activities. And that was to understand that people needed to know what they could do to stay connected, reduce isolation, keep in touch and keep fit. And all of those activities on information now are free or very, very cheap. And that makes sure that people keep connected and involved in the city. So what I would say is every tool needs a resource sitting behind it who are doing the thinking and the, and the feedback, looking at the feedback on how to use the tool. And our job is to keep it dynamic, keep it relevant and keep it timely. And developing digital tools does take some thought. If you'd like to know more about how we do things in Newcastle City Council, my details are there, information now at newcastle.gov.uk. And I'm also delighted to take further questions. We're always developing the tools and we now have a messaging system that takes people straight to the URL for your equipment, Newcastle, and for information now. Thank you for listening. Lovely. Thank you very much, Kate. So as I said previously, we are running a little bit late. However, we are going to go into the question and answer panel now. So Melanie, Dawn and Kate have kindly agreed to um, be involved. And also I'm going to bring in Janet Seward, who's our program manager at DLF as well. So I'm going to start off with a couple of questions. Here we go. So just cost first, Melanie. So is there a cost for a customised version of our SARA? Oops, sorry, I couldn't unmute. Sorry about that. Um, there is a cost. Um, what we're looking at is very much specifically to people's needs. So what we tend to do is we will liaise with you and find out exactly what it is you need. Um, and then we're able to cost what our Xara 
license would be for you specifically. Like I said before, it is bespoke and it is tailored to your needs. So if anybody has, um, is interested in Arxara, they can get in contact with myself and we can discuss what their needs are. There is a process to doing it. Um, so there is an actual license fee that is on a kind of tiered system between one to five years, um, but and also the development of Arxara. So if you do want to know more about what your needs are specifically, um, then I can sit down with you and discuss that and then we could look at the cost implications for your specific version. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I think we might have lost Dawn, so I'm just not going to anything that's for Dawn. I won't I direct because she's. I think she might have had to drop off the call. So, um, Melanie, other question for you. Sorry. Um, can licensees change the questions and advice in Arsara? The questions are set to some extent um, because of the back end and how it's produced. Um, so the questions, depending on what you'd want to do. So I think it's the questions that we have set up are quite formulaic in terms of them steering directly to the solutions and linked to specific products. Um, it'd be interesting to know what types of questions people would like to um, change um, because we have quite a wide breadth of questions actually on there. So it'd be interesting to find out a bit more detail. I'm not sure who asks that, if they're still available, if they can get in contact with myself so I can see what area and probably what they want to know is probably already on there. I think a lot of people do tend to say, can we change things? But when they actually go onto the system, they find that the question already exists. And if anybody does want to get in, if anybody does want to get into contact with Melanie or anyone at um, DLF, then I think Janet has just put everyone's details into the chat box there. But I will just say it's melanie.poiser at dlf.org.uk. If anyone wants to get straight in, in contact with us. OK, let's have a look at the next one. In terms of end of, oh, I'm sorry, Melanie, this is another one for you. <laughs> in terms of independent living, does DLF go as far as highlighting bits of kit as major as new homes? So let's repeat the question again. So in in regards to um, the parts, the bits of kit that are on the um, website, mm -hmm. do you go as far as um, new houses, new homes? As someone I think that um, works for a, a homes company here was just asking about that. Janet, I don't know if you want Janet, to jump in. Yeah, do you want me to answer that one? Homes. Yeah, smart homes. So um, we, there is a, another great little uh, charity called um, EAC who have um, a similar tool to us, Sarah, called Hoop Housing Options. Um, and that provides um, questions and answers and advice about the different types of housing that might be suitable. So uh, we tend to deal with um, practical solutions to people remaining in their existing um, home. So aids, adaptations, digital solutions, uh, and so on. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, Kate, I'm gonna to come to you now, if that's okay. Um, what sort of additional information did you add to your Ask Sarah? So for your equipment, Newcastle? Right, I think there were two or three things, really. I think Melanie's right. A lot of the questions are completely suitable for for uh, most people's needs. I think what we did was, um, we were very keen on the issue of accessibility. So we looked very carefully, particularly on the new version and we got involved in looking at that accessibility uh, information. So the outlining of something in yellow when you're clicking on it and that sort of thing is just really important for a lot of users. Um, in particular, there are three banners that you can use, which come out in the report. And that's what we did. We uh, took people straight to Social Care Direct if they needed to make that phone call still. Uh, we took them to Minor Repairs and Adaptations, which is a different team, which is allied to our occupational therapists at the council. And so they were sort of maybe the quick fix aspect of home repair and adaptations. And then we also take them to the wheelchair service at the Freeman Hospital. So there are three fixed banners and you can only use three. So you'd have to change your information. And interestingly, we've, we've looked at things in the same way as the previous speaker. And we're looking at whether we should take people to something like Hoop as well. But we do take people to the Hoop tool on information now already. So I think we were very keen to get involved in the icons that were on the site. So we thought they were usable, user friendly and indicated issues of accessibility. Lovely. Thank you, Kate. Uh, the next one I think is going to come to Janet or Melanie, whoever wants to jump in. So how do you quality assure the products used on the website? 
do you um, have an evaluation framework or anything like that? Do you want me to take that one? Yeah. So um, we have a data services team who liaise with manufacturers and retailers. Um, and we have um, standard uh, sets of information that we ask them to provide us with so that we can include all of that data on our database. And then we liaise with them on a regular cycle to basically keep that information up to date and accurate. If it isn't validated within a set cycle time, then that's then archived and not shared with the public. In terms of, I think the, the question was probably more getting at, do we rate or rank the, the products? Um, we don't. Uh, what we do is we publish um, impartial information about them uh, we don't um, rate or rank them. It's a particularly difficult thing to do um, anyway uh, within this sector because um, a lot of the uh, value of a product depends on um, the person and their needs um, and how they would use that aid or adaptation. Um, but it is something that we are thinking about, whether we could do more in that area. And we are uh, going to be partnering um, with a particular um, disability organisation that have carried out some um, user reviews of, of a selection of products. And we're going to be sharing that through through the platform. So um, it is something we'd like to do more of. Just to come back, someone's asked in the chat um, about HOOP. It's, it's HOOP. So the HOOP is an acronym. It's for Housing Options for Older People, just in case people the sound quality wasn't so good. And Kate has actually put uh, the link to HOOP in the um in the chat box there for you. All right. All right. Next question. I'm going to come to come to Kate again. I'm oh, sorry, Kate. Uh, so how did you identify the services and programs that needed to be added and signposted for residents in Newcastle? I think we went back to our 15 years experience of using information now and looking at our Google Analytics and what people were looking for. We also work within adult social care across teams. So we've got the social work team and we've got the occupational therapy team. And so we can work together to see what people are looking for. So we predicted really the bath and the shower uh, the stairs, the mobility sort of questions. I think what additionally has come out is that sort of transfer down steps, um, getting around the garden, getting things to the right height in the garden so you can still do gardening and not give up on gardening, which, you know, is a massive solace as I think most of us have noticed during lockdown. So um, really, I think that's what we did. We were lucky to have 15 years of the experience and information from Information Now. Thank you. Melanie, this is definitely coming to you. <laughs> so you oh yeah, it, there's no, no doubts about this one. So you've worked on our SARA programmes in London and South East. So what sort of changes do councils make once they have our SARA? I think the key thing is about our SARA, it is for the council, like I said, I think in the presentation, it's very unique to your, the characteristics of your locality. I think the key changes that people make is very much in terms of the visual identity. So when you get ArcSara, it's not as though it links you to it and you come onto our platform. Realistically, what you're doing is you're embedding it within your own identity. So it sits very much like our presenters have shown. It sits very much within the identity of your local authority. I think the key things that you do with ArcSara is that you put your own information in there. So you'll sign posts specifically where you want your um, residents and service users to go. So the key things that what, what we work with you very closely in is we give you a workbook. So we sit down and you can fill in this workbook. So you put all the partners you want to work with. It's basically an opportunity. And I think it's a brilliant opportunity that you sit and you really think about how you sign post your service users to get the help they need. And if you don't do that on any other occasion this really kind of steers you to think about how can we get the best help so I think in terms of changes it really helps local authorities really take a strategic look about the services they provide how people access those services and kind of maps out the front door to um, accessing them services as well and probably looking at who else can be involved as I said it's not just any one team's personal problem in terms of dealing solutions um, finding solutions for residents is everybody's responsibility so it pulls local authorities together I think. 
Wonderful, thank you. I think we might stick with either yourself or with uh, with Janet. So the, the Carers UK version looks great. Do you have plans to work with other major charities or have other national versions? Uh, we we do want to work with um, an, uh, a number of uh, other major charities, for example, particularly charities that specialise in um, catering for beneficiaries with um, particular condition, for example, where we can tailor and present the information that would be more relevant to them. Having said that, DLF has always been a great believer in um, what, what we call, what everyone calls co comorbidity. In other words, we would always want all of the advice to be available for people because, you know, any particular person might have a combination of needs. But what we can do is we can we can take more of a tailored approach with that. So we are in discussions with a number of of, of leading organisations. Having said that, we have a specific um, goal over the next 12 months to also um, develop a more tailored approach to, as Melanie was mentioning earlier, um, people with learning disabilities. Um, we think that there is more work that we could do in uh, really addressing uh, those people's needs more um, clearly and also uh, really studying um, how we can improve the accessibility to it um, and what those specific needs would be. Uh, we know from research that's been published globally that um, there's also an issue around the adoption of, of solutions. So even when someone's identified a solution, um, there's, there's then often a barrier to, to actually using it and getting used to it and, and, and embracing it within their lives. And we'd like to also study you know, what we can do to help with that, whether that's around hints and tips or, or guidance. Um, and that's something that uh, we have a programme uh, of work that we're going to be uh, em embarking on uh, quite soon, led by Melanie, in fact. Fantastic. I think, yeah, I think that's one of the key things. I think it's and I think everybody here will agree that there is a plethora of equipment out there and people I speak to a lot really don't know what to prescribe because they don't know or they, they just don't know. So it's really about organising that into really clear, um, identifiable and accessible um, pathways for people. So, yeah, I'm really excited to look at the learning disabilities portal because I think it can be something that's very specific, especially digital um, assistive technology. Wonderful, thank you. Come, coming back to yourself, Kate, I think. Um, NCC uses um, Recite Me across their websites. Is this important for services like YEN and Arsara? And how does it work and what does it add? Yeah, I think Recite Me is a really, really good tool. I mean, I'm not here to do that kind of product promotion. And they are a Northeast company, of course. But actually, you know, I've used Browse Aloud and a few others over the years, and Recite Me definitely does work. Um, I think what, what I really appreciate about it is its range. So you can go for a text-only approach, going back to what Melanie and Janet have just been saying about somebody with a learning disability, for instance, or autism. Um, they will want to get rid of all those logos and that you know, flashing that goes on in their heads. So what they want is just the text and you can create just a text on your website. So that's really good. Um, you can also have the website read out loud to you and it's, uh, you can change the pace at which it's read out loud to you. So you have full control of your accessibility. Um, it's also got um, a, a screen mask, which will help pe for people with learning disability or to autism. If you're visually impaired, you've got the read aloud aspect of it. If you're, we've got a, a, a big Chinese population in Newcastle, and so it can be translated into a number of languages. And also you get that audio aspect of the translation on some of the languages as well. So I really do think it's a very good tool. We have, we've designed our little um, button to put it on your equipment Newcastle I'm very sad to say didn't quite get it on for today but we'd have been very proud if it had been there and um, yes we do think it's really really important part of accessibility we also use something called site improve to check our accessibility and we check that monthly to check that we're meeting all that accessibility criteria which every council has to do now 
Lovely, thank you very much. I think we've come to the end of the questions that we've got so far. Um, I know there are a few questions for Dawn. Unfortunately, I think Dawn's internet has, um, has given up the ghost. So I will try and put those to Dawn um, at another time and see if I can upload those onto the back of the webinar at some point. So apologies for those people who did ask questions for Dawn. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to say thank you to Janet, Melanie and Kate, and also to Dawn and to Louise for their time today.